Hey everyone, what's up? Hope you've been doing well. Uh, recently I've been getting a lot of questions about my wildlife photography post-processing workflow. I've made a few videos on Topaz, about how I use Topaz, on Lightroom, how I use Lightroom, answered some questions about Photoshop, and today we're gonna dive into my wildlife photography post-processing workflow and show you guys what I do with my wildlife photography. So first, before we hop into things, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Ben Q and their product Screen Bar Plus. I actually got this sent to me recently and shipped to me recently, and I've really enjoyed my experience so far with it. So one of the problems that I come into in my editing and post-processing workflow is that I'm literally looking at a computer screen all day long. So what's cool about this Screen Bar is that it's pretty genius. It helps eliminate that eye fatigue no matter what scenario you're in because it gives a little bit more of an even lighting around your workspace without throwing glare on the computer, which is really cool. But it lights up your space, that way your eyes don't just get blown out by that blue light being thrown off your computer all the time. And I don't like to wear blue light glasses because it affects the way that I see the colors in my images and stuff like that. And so it's been really awesome to have that tool. And literally just yesterday, I tried it out. After using the screen bar for like a week, I tried out not using the screen bar for like a six hour edit and I felt the fatigue in my eyes that I hadn't felt in the days prior. So it really has worked awesome and really well. So if you guys are interested in checking it out, checking out what it's all about, checking out some more details on it or purchasing it, make sure to check out my affiliate link in the description below. And I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I have. So to get started, I wanted to talk to you guys about two different categories. And the reason why I wanna address these things is before we get into my post-processing workflow, I wanted to talk about the type of photographer I am. So in my brain, with, with wildlife and bird photography, it's kind of unique in that you have kind of two different types of photographers is what I've generally noticed. I'm very much an art-oriented wildlife photographer. Like I care about the art of the wildlife photography so much more then I care about just the documenting process. And that's not to say that the documenting process isn't important. It's actually very, very needed. Scientifically, it's incredibly needed. But I just incline to be more of an artist. So what I really care about is getting that nice artistic look to my images, where some people just care about capturing really cool action in a bird as they're swooping down into the water, or maybe even just capturing a photo of a rare bird. And for those people, that's awesome, but this is probably not the post-processing workflow that you wanna go through because it's gonna take you probably way too long for what you're doing, or it's just not worth the effort that you're putting into it. But as an artist, as an artistic photographer, this is my post-processing workflow and how I work through my wildlife photography images. So first what I do is I'll sit down and usually I'll sit down on a couch or something like that at home with my wife by my side and I'll start scrolling through all my images, right? I'll look through which ones are good, which ones are bad, which ones were just duplicates of basically the same thing and narrow all those down. So I'll just go through and I'll delete a bunch. I do have a dual card backup in case I accidentally delete something wrong. So if you don't have a dual card backup, definitely be hesitant in this situation to just go through and start deleting a bunch of stuff because you might find out you need it or want it later. However, my scenario, it's fine. So I go through and I narrow it down to about 5% of the images. So that means I delete probably about 95% of my images right off the bat, right out of the camera, and I keep about 5% of them. Kind of a crazy number if you think about it because if I shoot, for example, a thousand images, I'm only even gonna keep 55% of them, or in other words, 50 of them on my hard drive. But beyond that, I narrow it down even further. So next, I'll pull up Lightroom and I'll start to sort through them even in further detail. And in Lightroom, usually I'll narrow out about another 50% in ones that just aren't worth my time to edit, right? So we take those 50 photos and we take them down to about 25 at that point. Now that I have my 25 images that I really wanna work on and I really wanna edit, I'll start going through my Lightroom process. So my Lightroom process looks a little bit like this. While I freestyle and things always vary and change per individual photo, generally this is kind of the path that I take in Lightroom. Usually I'll start out with my tone curves and getting my curve exactly where I want it to be to help enhance the dynamic range or maybe to keep the blacks from falling off too harsh or maybe to pop the sky a little bit more. Whatever it may be, I'll start with my tone curves typically. Next, I'll typically move to my exposure. Reason being that if you have a well exposed image, it's gonna affect the way that you see your color next. So I'll usually move into my exposure, adjust the contrast, the exposure level as a whole, 
mess around with the highlights, the shadows, blacks, and whites. And afterwards, I'll move into my white balance with just the color temperature and the color tint. At the color temperature and color tint, it's super important because if you can nail down this well, if you've shot in raw and you can nail down your white balance well, it'll really allow you to make it super easy to edit naturally to what the photo would actually look like in real life. And you shouldn't have to do much, if any, of very specific color grading adjustments on color wheels or HSLs. Next, after my white balance is adjusted correctly, I'll move into vibrance and saturation just to get the, the color and the life to where I want it to be. Typically, I do like my photos a little bit vibrant and a little bit saturated, but I'm very careful not to pull them too saturated to where they just look fake or pastel-y. After vibrance and saturation, I'll usually move down into my HSLs and do small color or saturation, hue, luminance type of adjustments to individual colors, but usually not too much of this to make it look, again, fake or filter-like. And finally, sometimes I'll move into the color wheel section of Lightroom, but that doesn't happen too often as usually I feel like I can take care of most of my problems before I ever get to this step. So after I've gone through Lightroom and all these steps, what I'll go into next is Topaz AI. So there's a three-part Topaz AI system that I use very often. Sharpen AI, Denoise AI, and Gigapixel. AI. I just found these an integral part of my workflow and I have really loved adding them on in these last couple months. So if a photo I find needs to be corrected from motion blur or being slightly, slightly out of focus, I'll usually use Sharpen AI in those scenarios. However, if I just need something to be denoised, I'll split it between Sharpen AI and Denoise AI. It depends which one in which scenario I'll use it for, but both tools can be great in different scenarios. Lastly, if I need more resolution out of it, I'll wind up using Gigapixel AI, but Gigapixel AI is not as regular a part of my workflow as Sharpen and Denoise are. If you guys want more information on these Topaz programs, I've made some cool videos on them in the past couple months. I'll throw one in the card above or in the end screen of this video description below, so make sure to check Check those out if you're interested. Lastly, people do ask me quite a bit about if I use Photoshop or not. Typically, I don't use Photoshop. I'm actually pretty well versed in it for my client work that I do in my videography or photography world. But as a wildlife photographer, I try to avoid it by most means because Typically, the stuff that you need that for is for more unnatural looks and more filtered or more photoshopped type of looks, right? And that's not what I'm going for in my wildlife photography normally. And so I typically avoid Photoshop as a whole. However, it's definitely a tool you can use and there's a plethora of things that can be done with it. So I hope you guys enjoyed today's video and were inspired to get out in nature more. If you guys wanna learn from me in one-on-one -on -one personal instruction, make sure to check out my mentorship program in the link in the description below. And I'd love to work with you guys guys one-on-one -on -one in personal mentorships to help grow you guys in your wildlife photography. Hope you enjoyed today's video and I can't wait to see you guys in the next one.